If I hear the name of Jesus, I just experience peace. I experience the work of God. I experience the power of God. I experience the enablement of God. And the more we get into grace, the more uh, significant the name Jesus becomes to us. Because we see what is in that name. We see the salvation in that name. We see the obedience on our behalf in that name. We see the righteousness of God in that name, free from our works, free from what we do for God. And when we receive the righteousness of God, the goodness of God, the... the um, <coughs> now, this is wrong English, but I want to put it this way. The who God is into us, we start to have the actions and the works of God manifesting in our lives. And that's the difference between good works and dead works. Good works is works that flows out of a person that has already been made good by the blood of Jesus. And dead works is works that flows out of the ministration of death that was written and engraved on stones called the law. Now if you out of the law try to serve God, you are in dead works. Paul clearly says that if you try to obey days and do certain things in order to be blessed, in order to try to please God, you are worldly. And the elements of this world, Paul clearly says to us, is rules and regulations and all those type of things by which we seek righteousness or to be blessed of God or to come to a place where we are approved of God to the point that we can then receive blessing. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about finances, we need to understand that Jesus has included finances in the cross. And I want to read an awesome scripture in the Bible. <laughs> And, man, you can't get past the scripture because Jesus is the final authority on finances. And uh, I want to read this, and I know this is going to bless you. And uh, just before I get into this, I want to say this. I'm not saying this for the purpose that you must feel in your heart now prompted to give to the ministry. That's not why I say this. I believe that the Holy Spirit works in the hearts of people to do that, but that's not the purpose of me teaching on this. The purpose that I teach on this is so that I can see you prosper by the message of grace. That's all. And so many times people say, man, give to my ministry because what I want to see is you prosper by you giving to my ministry. Now that doesn't sound right. If you go to a beggar and you tell him, listen, give me what you've got because I want to see you prosper, there's something wrong. It's just simple. We don't have to interpret 20 scriptures to see that. That's just the way it is. You can't go to a poor man, tell him, give me what you have and think that he's going to become rich through that. And uh, if people think, <clears throat> and, I, and I mean there are many people that think that if you give to somebody, um, then that's going to be multiplied. And we use examples out of the Old Testament where the, um, the lady came and she had nothing. She took that nothing. She gave the prophet food and that oil and that... Um, Flour never stopped. It was just increasing all the time. Now that's fine. That means if I go into a meeting, a church meeting, and I take my last hundred rand and I give it to the man of God, then there'll be another hundred rand in my wallet right there. That's if you want to use that scripture. Because it never stopped. She took it out through it and then from there, the, the place where she took it out of, right there immediately was another one. Now, if, if, if we preach that and we can do it that way, then we can use that scripture, but then we must have that testimony in the lives of the majority of people that walk by that principle. If we don't have that testimony, then there's something wrong, because the Word of God works. It's not a Word that doesn't work. If we preach on healing and we go to a crusade, yes, of course, we're going to see some people that doesn't get healed, but we're going to see most of the people receiving healing. We've just had a wonderful crusade in Kolbaskral. I prayed for people that got healed. Vessel prayed for people that got healed. Elena, my wife, prayed for people. Elise, everybody. Last night I wasn't at the meeting, but all the people that was there that came from, from the town that went on to this outreach to help the people, they prayed for the sick and everybody saw miracles. It's not just, oh, the mighty man of God with the anointing for the hour. No, everybody that believes in Jesus that says, I by faith receive the power of the Holy Spirit to do what God called us to do, can do those things. And I think we should get this thing out of the church for with this one man with the only anointing. It's not the way it's supposed to be. I believe we are supposed to work in teams. We are the body of Christ. Now, I, I also understand that the word teaches that everybody doesn't walk um, in that great measure of miracle signs and wonders like 
uh, I would say TB Joshua does or someone's really operating in the gift of healing. But you can also see that power in your life. It's not to say that if somebody prospers, that only he's going to prosper and you're not going to prosper. It's not to say that if somebody is healed <coughs> or operates in, in prophecy, that you cannot prophesy. You can also prophesy. Maybe not to the extent of that person, but you can also experience that in your life. Hallelujah. And uh, we must start to see the body of Jesus Christ. And the thing of this one man with the anointing, takes away dignity and worth from the church because we think this person has got this major revelation. I've seen people come to me and they just put me on a pedestal in a place where I don't belong. I, I, and I understand if it, it's, uh, the Bible clearly teaches that you can take a man of God and you must honor him and he's worthy of double honor. Now that means, yes, honor the guy. Why? Because he's teaching the word of grace to you. If you don't honor the preacher, you will not honor what he says. But if you honor what he says, you're honoring the preacher, you're saying this man is really bringing the words of life, the, the, the gospel of Jesus to us, so that we can operate in the same power as what he does, or even more. But he is watching over my soul, because he wants, he wants it to go well with me, therefore he takes time and effort to make sure that everything preached is has got a grace foundation and is grace-based. Hallelujah. We don't honor men of God because they are just saying they are pastors. That's not why we do it. We're honoring them because they are bringing the message of grace to us. Now, if you are watching Web Church for the first time and you are in a church and you don't think that your pastor preaches a grace-based message, please don't go and now degrade him. That's the wrong thing to do. Walk in love. The Bible says always speak the truth in love. Always let your words be seasoned with salt so that it might impart grace unto the hearer. Always walk in honor to all men. Love people. I'm not saying that we should, you know, Christians fight too much. We're not supposed to be fighting everybody all the time. The only fight that there is, and this is what the Bible says, is resist the devil. Now, how do we resist the devil? By staying in the message of God's grace. By staying in the message of God's unconditional love that He has for us. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to finances, I want to just read the scripture. And uh, just to, to remind you again, the purpose why we preach a little bit on finances in every session is, number one, is one of the greatest needs in the world today. Everybody watching Web Church today, most people in the church today, most people in the world today will say, I need more money. I need money. I need to know how to handle my money. I need to, I need to know how to have stability financially and all those type of things. So um, that's why it's important to teach on this. It is not like, <clears throat> it's not from the foundation of we need your money today. Okay? Right. <clears throat> this is what Jesus taught. He says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall you eat, or what shall you drink, or wherewith shall you be clothed? For after these things... The, do the Gentiles seek, or Gentiles, I, I want to use another word there, or those that has no father. They are seeking for those things. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. Now, um, <clears throat> there's a mentality that says God knows before we even ask what need we have, but we still need to ask, and our way of asking is giving to the kingdom of God. Sowing seed, giving into the, that's our way of asking. Now, that can be a way of asking, but it is not the way that God says you must ask in, otherwise you're not going to receive. So you can go and say, my God, <coughs> excuse me, my God, um, I'm going to give and I thank you that you are a God that is providing for me. And that is a way in which you show your faith. But let me tell you, that, can, that type of way is preached most of the time as the only way of asking God. It's not the truth. The way we ask God is by simply inquiring as if there was financial provision in the cross. You ask God, God, can you meet this need because of what Jesus has done? And then he said, it is met, my son or my daughter. And then you believe it with all your heart and you go and do what you must do in your business or um, in your job, what you must do. And you'll see the blessing of God manifest not because of what you've done financially for the kingdom of God, but because of what God has done for you in Jesus Christ, and you've got access into that grace by faith. Now, faith has got different actions. By faith, you can say, I believe God is my source, and He's always provided for me, 
and I can give, even out of poverty give. <clears throat> or you can say, I believe that God is my source, you know, and you can go and buy something for yourself. Or you can, that's an action of faith. Man, you can buy faith, go and buy something. Because your mind is resting in the finished work of Jesus. Or what you can do is, you can simply say, well, I thank God that I don't have to do anything special with my finances, either buy something or give something to convince my heart, but I rest in the finished work simply believing it in my heart. And you will have it. Amen. I'm not talking about people not working. So many times people get confused saying that we are not supposed to work. The Bible says, he that doesn't work shall not eat. I'm talking about physical work in this world. Now, you must have a job. You must work <coughs> in order to get finances. You must do something. You know, uh, sell something, do something. But the blessing that rests upon it, what makes it work successfully, comes from the cross. It comes in the obedience of Jesus on your behalf. Hallelujah. If I just go and I sit down and I say, well, I'm never going to do anything. Uh, <coughs> let me tell you, I will struggle financially. But if I go and I say, my God, um, what I want to do is preach your gospel. And that's what I do for a living. I preach your gospel. Let me tell you, I will live out of the word of God. I will live out of that gospel. God will provide for me. It's just the way it is. It's not that God will not provide for you if you don't do anything. But remember, God is spirit. And he needs a physical thing through which he will manifest finances. And that is your job or your business or what you do, or what you place in front of God. And I've, I tell you, there was time when I was really struggling, and I would place many things in front of God. And I would say, my God, I will do welding, I'll fix a car, I'll move somebody's stuff. I'll, I put 20 things out. My God, whenever you find something through which that blessing can flow, I will take it. And that blessing was not based on if I gave my money to the church or not. It was based as if God gave His Son to us or not. Hallelujah. And then out of gratitude, I would give something. Now, well, I hope you understand this. But just listen a little bit to what the Bible says we can do in order to prosper. It says, <clears throat> For after these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. But if you want to seek something, if you want to look for something, seek first His kingdom, His way of rulership. In other words, if you want to seek His kingdom, you want to see how does money, how does, or how does Jesus rule over poverty? And how does finances work in the kingdom of God? Now, everything in the kingdom of God works by, works by grace. Okay? So, you know the grace of God. He was rich. He became poor. So, due to His poverty, might be made rich. So, in the kingdom of God, we prosper by the obedience of Jesus on our behalf. The fact that He became poor, so that we, through His poverty, might be made rich. And now it says, seek His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. <clears throat> so, added means you receive something as a gift. How do we receive righteousness? Righteousness we receive as a gift. We don't receive righteousness by our works. We are made righteous, the Bible says, by faith without the works of the law. And added unto that are all things. Man, that's a gift with some side blessings. Amen. Now, if you seek the righteousness of God, <clears throat> the right that God has to be blessed, what Jesus has done, His, um, His, His holiness, His righteousness, His goodness of character that qualifies Him to be blessed, His right to prosper because of what He's done, because of who He is. If you seek that, and I'm, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> let me just drink some water here. I tell you, this cold messed up my voice. I feel good, but the voice is not good yet. You can pray for me if you like to. Amen. Right. <clears throat> if you seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, His righteousness... Now, remember, remember you might say, why, why must I seek righteousness? This was written to Old Testament people that didn't know the righteousness of God. And once you... Seek the righteousness of God, and I want to explain it this way. When you are tired of saying, by what I do I'll become, and you say, that righteousness is not good enough in order for me to be blessed, but I want God's righteousness, and you, then you'll start to get onto the path of what Jesus has done for you. And when you get onto the path of what Jesus has done for you, you will be made the righteousness of God, and then you will never hunger and thirst for righteousness anymore. Now, I'm not, I don't want to... 
go on to this teaching uh, deep into that. I want to just get into this teaching of, I want you to know that as you get into the message of what is done for you, prosperity comes your way and all things are added with it. Not by you seeking it, not by you desiring it all the time, not by you trying to have something special to do in order to get that to manifest. That's not the truth. The truth is, I don't look at the birds of the air, or I look at the birds of the air that don't sow or reap or gather into bonds because my Heavenly Father blesses them. Because my Heavenly Father blesses them, I can see that He will bless me because that I'm worth much more than the birds of the air. So what I do is I seek my Father's righteousness. Now what is my Father's righteousness? How does my Father's righteousness work? Now, I want to read a scripture and uh, go a little bit into the message for today. It is in Psalm, uh, Psalm 40 verse 10. What is the righteousness of God? I just want to ask you, Vessel, can you just lift that aircon a little bit up there? I don't want the cold wind on me. <clears throat> right, Psalm uh, 40 verse 10. Now this, is, this speaks prophetically about Jesus portraying the righteousness of God. It says, uh, let's preach, uh, read, read from verse 9. It says, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord. You know, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have, now listen, he says, I've preached about your righteousness. I haven't hid your righteousness. I've spoken about your righteousness. He says, I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. So what is the righteousness of God? It's God's faithfulness, God saving people, God's loving kindness, and God's no consciousness of sin. That is God's righteousness. So if you seek His righteousness, you're going to start, go and say, I want to seek His faithfulness in blessing me. Not His faithfulness through my faithfulness, or how faithful I must be. The Bible says if we're not faithful, He remains faithful. Now this is a shocker for religion. Many people believe this when it comes to going to heaven, but we don't want to apply it in our marriages, we don't want to apply this in our finances, we don't want to apply this in the things of this life. And the reason why many people don't want to apply this is because then they cannot sit as a big boss and rule everybody under them. Because people, because people will just say, man, God's my source. Why will I be manipulated? If people come and say, you know, if you give to my church, then God's going to bless you. Then God's going to prosper you. If, if you're under this message saying, man, I'm not seeking uh, uh, your goodness. I'm seeking the goodness of God. And the goodness of God is His faithfulness. Now, God is faithful to bless us. Why is God ever faithful? In Corinthians it says, God is ever faithful because of Jesus. Because Jesus became a human being, He forever will be our representative. That's why God cannot change. He is faithful never to think of our sins, never to judge us according to our sins if we are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. And I want you to know that when I preach this, I don't preach this from a platform of the people that are listening to me as unbelievers. I preach this from a platform of you are already in Christ you are already believing in Jesus. You are already, you've already become the righteousness of God. You are saved by the blood of Jesus. You are washed in the blood of Jesus. That's the platform from which I preach. So if I say, all of us are righteous, I'm not saying the whole world is righteous. Because the whole world's not righteous. You are righteous by faith. By faith you, ha you enter into. When I say we are all righteous, I'm talking about everybody that's listening. Amen. Hallelujah. And that are saved and believing in Jesus. So, Let's go back to Matthew. <coughs> it says here in Matthew, well, I'm in Romans. Matthew chapter 6. Listen to this. It says, but first, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. What is, what is His righteousness? His faithfulness towards you. His salvation towards you. So, if you come to a place where you say, I don't want to seek my salvation through what I do financially, but I'm seeking how He saves me financially. 
How has He saved us financially? He was rich, He became poor, so that we through His poverty might be made rich. That's 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Then you can go to uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Then He says there, And God is able to make all grace abound over you, increasing your giving. So what He said is, by grace you prosper and have more finances. It's by grace. It is not by what you do for God. It's not by your sowing and reaping and what you must do for God. Now I want you to be established in this because how are we going to have the higher glory, the rest in our minds that God intended for us when it comes to finance if we are not preaching about these things? Hallelujah. I just feel I'm hard to touch on one more scripture. Um, go to Galatians. Man, I want to just say to everybody in Web Church, I love you. And it's such a blessing for me to preach here today. I just feel such an honor, you know, to just minister this gospel of grace. To think that we've got a congregation that congregates live around the world today. There are people watching, people don't even know. And I know that this is going to grow. We're going to see more and more people being touched by this. The vision is not to have Web Church as the biggest church in the world. That's not the vision. The vision is to, through Web Church, touch the lives of people. Now, if it becomes big, bless God, because it means it's many people. Um, if it stays the way it is, bless God for those who are touched. Hallelujah. Amen. Galatians chapter 6, <clears throat> and um, we read there from verse 6. It says, Let him that is taught in word communicate or partner or become part of unto him that teaches in all good things. But be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man sow, that he will reap. Now, that so many times I see, is seen as finances. As I give money to um, the preacher, then God's going to increase my finances. That's not what it says. Now, indirectly your finances will be increased if you give yourself to the grace preacher because you will listen to the grace message, and the grace message will prosper you. Now, in the Jewish tradition, when it says communicate unto him that teaches in all good things, good things means to, uh, to do good to people. It also includes your finances, to do good to people. So what he was saying um, between the lines is, accept, he was saying two things, accept what the grace guy gives you and support him. Forget now, forget money for a moment. Just support him, be with him, stand with him, be a partner, be a partaker that's the, the, the Greek word they communicate, means to be a partaker. Be a partaker of his message. It says, for if you give your life to the flesh, the flesh not speaking of your sins, the flesh speaking of the works of the law. You can go and read that in chapter 3 and also in chapter 6 verse 13. Flesh speak, speaking about the law. He says, listen, Give yourself, become a part of and a partaker of the grace preacher and not the law preacher. Because if you give yourself and your life and your resources and whatever, if you give yourself to the law guy, out of that you're going to reap corruption. God is not mocked. Don't think that you by your works are going to stand right before God. He, he, he will not be mocked. You will only stand righteous before God because of what Jesus has done. And if you believe it, it is yours. Without faith, you are condemned already. The Bible says, those who believe are born of God. I want to make that clear. You are not born of God if you don't believe. If you believe, you are born of God. Amen. So this is for people that believe this simple truth. Now this is sometimes so hard to believe. How can this scripture mean this? Because I've always been thinking that I must use this scripture um, as pros uh, to prosper. And I mean, I, rem I remember when I preached this scripture as a scripture to get money into my ministry. Now this was when I was under the law back in Potchefstroom. We had a small church uh, um, that we started uh, there as well amongst the, just the servant people that work, uh, worked in the houses. And uh, that, that I preached this there. I said, in Kimberley as well, before I got into the grace in 92, 93, early 94, I preached this. I said, listen, listen if you sow money, God is not going to be mocked. He will, he's going to increase your money. He's going to make you rich. But, and the reason why we preach that is because of a need of finances. I mean, 
I was thinking, how will I get money? Because this church must run on finances. I mean, my car needs petrol, we need tires, we need this, we need that. And that's what I preached. But when I got into the grace of God, my mind changed. And my eyes were opened. And I could see the truth in that scripture. Now listen, um, if you don't see it that way, don't try to see it in a different way. Get first, get into the grace, because you need first need to be enlightened. You first need to get a place where you understand what Jesus has done for you, and then they take that from, a found, from that foundation, you can interpret things in the Bible. Hallelujah. So it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatsoever man sow, that he will reap. Now people say, whatever you sow, if you sow a car, you're going to reap a car. It's not the truth. It says, For he that sows to his flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. There's just two things you can reap according to verse 8. Corruption, or it says, But he that soweth to his spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season, that well-doing speaks of giving yourself to the message of grace, and then blessing people out of that. Okay, well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. What shall we reap? Not money. It says there, we shall reap everlasting life. <laughs> Hallelujah. We so many times we just pull the thing out of context. No, that's what's written there. Verse 10. And we have therefore, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially, in their, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Man, isn't that awesome? So I want to tell you, give yourself to the message of grace. You will reap life everlasting. Amen. Now, life everlasting, what does that mean? It, it, I believe it, it's uh, written in Second Peter. And uh, we're just going to look at, at what God has blessed us with in Second Peter. Chapter 1 uh, <clears throat> and verse 3. It says, According as His divine power, He has given unto us all things that pertains to this life and unto godliness through the acknowledgement of Him, or what he knows, that has called us to glory and virtue. So what he's saying, he says, according to his divine power, he has given unto us all things that pertains to this life. Amen. To life and godliness. So he gives us life, physical life. He gives us everything in this life that we need. That life is just this normal life. House, car, clothes, whatever you need. The basic things for this life. He gives it to you and everything that pertains to godliness he has given to you through His divine power, not your divine effort. Amen. Now, I'm not against good works. I'm not against walking in the kingdom of God. For the Bible clearly says, He says there in Peter, do good things. He says there, do good unto everybody that is in the house, especially those that are in the household of faith. Now, why does He say that? Because He explained in the first couple of chapters who they were. And if they could believe who they were, they'll find the manifestation of good works in their lives and it will be very easy to do it. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, let's go to Matthew 5. <coughs> Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. It says, <coughs> Think that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I've not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one point or comma shall in any way pass from the law, till it is fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, what Jesus was saying in that scripture was that the Pharisees will be called least, because they cannot do and teach, but he will do and teach them. Amen? He will be called great. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness, listen to this now. This is, this is important. He says, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said by them of old time that you shall not kill, and whosoever, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. <clears throat> and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, let me see if I've got an explanation of that. Oh, yeah, vain fellow. Okay? 
shall be in danger of the council. Whosoever shall say, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave it there, leave your gift before the altar and go your way first and be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer the gift. Now, that's why it says, it says, therefore. In other words, uh, because it's so easy to do something wrong according to this, you'll, it's so easy to say, Raka, it's so easy to say, you're vain fellow, it's so easy to be angry. He says, if you know your brother's got something against you, go and make peace because just in front you might be angry with him and shout at him and then you're going to be in danger of judgment. So uh, <clears throat> what it says is, this is the life of a person that is always seeking peace. If he knows his brother's got something against him, he wants that peace. And he will go and make effort out of his life, even if the brother's got something against him, to go and make peace. Because this speaks of a righteousness that's higher than the righteousness of the Pharisees. This is speaking of the righteousness, if you read on, that Jesus brings for us. This was the standard of living Jesus lived by. The standard of living. Jesus was, he was, uh, 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 he's a type of person that if he knows you've got something against him, he's going to leave everything to see that your heart's at peace. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? God knew that there was something between him and man. And he said, let me go and sort it out. He was not the one that was in the wrong. Man was in the wrong. But God went, made an effort to sort it out. Amen. So, we're talking about a, a righteousness that is so much higher than the righteousness that the Pharisees and the Sadducees lived by. Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they lived, they had a very high standard of righteousness. They tithed. They gave a, 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 a priestly offerings. They gave love offerings. They lived a holy life. They had the right clothes. They looked just in front of them. They didn't, I mean, they did as much holy things as possible. Many of them didn't even get married. They stayed aside to give themselves completely to the, to the scriptures and the studying of the scriptures and all that. They were very holy people if you would just look at them like that. <clears throat> you know, they had very, very good conduct, very good life. But what Jesus said is, if you are not more holy than they, more righteous, you will not make it. That's it. You will not make it. Now, the higher righteousness is written down, and we've read it, and I want to I read it again. The higher righteousness is the righteousness by which God lives. And Jesus said, I've made known your righteousness. Now, there's a difference between the righteousness of Jesus and the righteousness of people that try to obey the law. <clears throat> the righteousness of people that try to obey the law was at a point where if a woman was caught in the act of adultery she would be publicly humiliated and murdered. Okay? But the righteousness of God was different than the righteousness of the Pharisees. That was written down in the law. There was a higher righteousness, a righteousness that says, I forgive. Okay? Now, <clears throat> I want to explain righteousness, and I hope I can get it right, because I've got this thing in my mind, and I don't know how to put it into words, but let me try and explain it. Who a person is, is seen by what he does. Now, who that person is, is then seen as his righteousness. Now, you can find a person that he is righteous, because he will live a good life, he's not going to cheat on his wife, he's going to love his children, he's just going to live a normal life. You will say, well, that's a fairly righteous guy. Then you get somebody like Mother Teresa. She would go and she would give her life. And people say, man, she's now really righteous. Because we could see who she is out of what she's done. And that who she is, the better person that is, the gooder, now, now this is, yeah, the better person she is, um, the higher her righteousness. Now what he was saying is, if your righteousness, if you're not a better person than the Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of God. Let me tell you what type of person you need to be in order to enter. You, 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 you need to be a, a type of person that doesn't even say, man, you're a vain fellow. You're the type of person that's not even angry with your brother for no reason. You know, now no reason, sometimes you can say, oh, I've got a reason. He looked at me bad. Now that's a reason. That's no reason. Okay? 
If you just say something bad, you are a murderer. Now imagine how high standard of living Jesus lived by and is inquired of God for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's very high. Now that righteousness is, let me read it again, I want, and I want to go into this now in depth in Psalms 40 verse 10. <coughs> It says, verse, uh, verse 7, Then lo, then I lo, come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. This is Jesus. Yes, your law is written in my heart. I have preached righteousness in the congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord. You knowest, I have not hid your righteousness within my heart. He says, your law has been poured out in my heart. He says, I've not hid your righteousness in my heart. I didn't just keep it there. Okay? It says, I have not hid your righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation, and I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Isn't that awesome? Now, now it goes on, it says, Withhold not thy loving, te uh, withhold not thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. So, um, <clears throat> what we need to understand is, the righteousness of God is the good things that God does. And the good things that God does is simply faithfulness, salvation, his salvation. What is His salvation? His salvation is what He's done in Jesus. Now, what type of a person uh, gives His life for sinners? Man, a very, very good, very, very righteous person. A real righteous guy <clears throat> is a guy that is so good that He gives to the poor, those that can never give back to Him. Those that give to sinners, those, those that love sinners, that's willing to die for sinners. Now imagine how good God must be to give His Son for sinners. Imagine that. That's awesome good. Right. He has not concealed His loving kindness. So God's righteousness is His loving kindness. And this is just a layman's uh, a definition of loving kindness. Loving so much that you are kind to people. His goodness, His love for people. Amen. He has not hid His loving kindness. Now, imagine God's loving kindness to people. Think of Jesus. Think of how much He loved sinners. The Bible says that sinners made it their custom to go to Jesus and listen to Him. It doesn't say disciples. It says sinners. Now, a sinner who got saved and then says, listen, I become your disciple now, is called a disciple. But he says, sinners made it their custom. So they even stayed sinners, but as sinners they still wanted to listen to Jesus. And Jesus didn't just chase them away. He didn't just go and rebuke them as, as bad and say, well, you know, by this time you ought to have repented, you, you know. No, no, he continued to love them. Isn't that good? The Bible says his loving kindness endures forever. His mercies endures forever. Hallelujah. There's no end to His loving kindness. There's no end to that. Now think how good He is. How righteous He must be in order to have that conduct, that way of living. It is very, very high. Listen, let's read it again. I have not hid thy righteousness. I have declared thy faithfulness. I have declared thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth. From the great congregation. Now the Bible says, You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Now what is the truth? You will know what God knows about you. That's the truth. You will not have this consciousness of sin all the time and the message of no consciousness of sin but a consciousness of what Jesus has done for you is what's going to set you free. What sets people free today in gospel crusades all over the world is when they hear that Jesus is not angry, but He paid for their sins and they can receive forgiveness of sins today. When people hear that, they get saved. Amen. Hallelujah. That's, that's what He says here. His, his truth. Now, He hasn't hid His truth. He hasn't hid the fact 
that He came to die for the sins of the world. He hasn't hit the fact that He came to take the judgment of others upon Him from them. And that's called the righteousness of God. Now it says, seek the righteousness of God. So when you read the Bible, the Bible says God is a reward of those that seek Him. So seek His righteousness, seek what He's done, if you want to read the Bible. Now, I don't say hunger and thirst after it. In other words, um, you know, I, I must still get it one day, that type of thing. Now, if you've not been made the righteousness of God, and we're going to get into that now, you can still get it. You can become that. Amen. Now, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we'll read there from verse 21. <clears throat> It says, For He has made Him, that is Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Man, isn't that awesome? It doesn't say we are the righteousness of God. It says that we might be made, through what He's done, the righteousness of God. Now that righteousness is imputed to us when we believe. What righteousness? The righteousness of God. The type of holiness that's in God. The standard of holiness that brings forth or, or that manifests as somebody that's willing to die for people, that's willing to be kind to sinners, that's willing to be merciful. That type of a good person, that's the higher righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees. That's the righteousness of God. That's the holiness of God. That's the who God is. Amen. Remember what I've said. If somebody gives to the poor, you will say, if somebody just lives a normal life, you will say, yeah, he's fairly righteous. If somebody gives to the poor, you will say, man, he's more righteous. If somebody goes and gives his life for sinners and he lives in the bush, you will say, he's a very righteous man. Now, how righteous is God? He's a very good, let's, let's use another word, good man. If you, are, if you are as good as the Pharisees, you will not make it, but you, you need to be as good as God. And then God says, He was made sin so that we might receive His goodness imputed unto us and then justified, treated accordingly as if we are as good as God. Man, you are not as good as God by your works. You either receive it as a gift or forget it. Amen. And what a mockery of the kingdom of God if you say, well, I've received the righteousness of God and I still don't qualify to be prosperous, I must still do something else. You're saying God is not even good enough to be blessed. And I've been made the righteousness of God, and uh, I must still go and sow and reap to get money out of God, for He's not good enough to be blessed financially, or be, to be prosperous. What a mockery. That's why the Bible says, give yourself the message of grace, otherwise you're making a mockery out of God. We're not going to mock God in this church, bless God. We're going to give Him all glory and all honor for what He's done. And we with meekness are going to receive the engraved or implanted word into our souls. So that we, our minds can be saved from this law consciousness and this death. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me just look into one more scripture and we're going to go deep into this. Next week, yes, Romans chapter 4 verse 1. I'm just going to touch on this and then next week we're going, to, we're going to continue there. Romans 4 verse 1. And uh, I believe for the next couple of Sundays we're going to speak on righteousness by faith. Now, we've laid the foundation. The righteousness that we receive is as holy as God is. Amen. Not the righteousness of Moses, not the righteousness of the law. If you were righteous by the law, you qualified for certain blessings. Now, imagine what you qualify for because you're as good as what God is. A good person, <clears throat> let, let's take it to normal practical life. If you are very good in athletics, in the 100 meters, you can run the 100 meters in sub 10. You know what? You're going to get some medals. Because that's what you can do, because you are so good. Is the same in the kingdom of God. Because God is so good. That's why all things that's good is just around Him. 
Now we've been made the goodness of God through His goodness. And He imputes that unto us through just simply believing. <clears throat> we believe that He has done it for us. Then we receive it. And we're going to look at Romans 4 now. When we receive that, we are made that righteousness and then treated accordingly. Man, isn't that awesome? Hallelujah. So that's why I can be healed. That's why I can be prosperous just because I'm righteous before God. And I believe it and through faith I'm justified. The just thing that's supposed to happen to a good person like that will happen. Listen, it's not just for a good man that is as good as God to struggle. It's not just. It's not just for him to walk with condemnation. It's not just for him to always be sick. It's not just for him to always worry about money. It's not just for him to live a life that says, well, to, to have a servant's mentality, to live like a servant. It's not just for him. It is just that he is blessed. It's just that he is prosperous. So I want to tell this, I want to say this when it comes to your finances. You've been made the righteousness of God and it's nothing, it, it, man, justice must happen and that blessing flows your way because you've been made righteous by faith in what Jesus has done for you. It's not right that a person that is as good as what God is struggles like somebody that is as bad as what Satan is. I hope you understand what I'm saying. And let's not take anything away from the righteousness of God. If you say, well, I cannot be blessed if I don't do something for God, you simply saying God's righteousness is not righteous enough to be blessed. That's it. Making a mockery out of the kingdom of God. Right, Romans 4. <clears throat> Romans 4 says, and I want to end off with this, it says, but to him that works not, in other words, I'm not saying that doesn't have a job. Works, when it speaks in Romans chapter 4, says that work to get God to do something for him. But he that work not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And we have been made now the righteousness of God. As righteous as a person that loves those that hate him. As righteous as a person that can turn the other cheek. As righteous as a person that when he offers something, he runs back and sorts out his problems. As righteous as a person that borrows and never think to get it back ever again. That's how righteous we are. Amen. Next week, we'll, we're just going to lay this again. and We'll get down into Luke chapter 6 and we'll explain. This is what it is. He says, <clears throat> But to him that works not but believe on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works. Say these words after me. He imputes righteousness without works. Now we need to get that into our minds. Hallelujah. He imputes righteousness without works. Now... There's this thing in the church where people think, and, in the, and I, I don't say just preachers, I'm talking about the church, people. that think that righteousness to go to heaven has been imputed unto us, but anything else that pertains to this life, you need to work to get. Now, if, if we believe that, we need to tear this out of the Bible. Because he says here, even as David described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness... Without works. And when you're righteous, you qualify for blessing. You qualify for healing. You qualify for everything. Because you are righteous. My righteousness is not in my works. My righteousness is in the, uh, 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 in the fact that God imputes it unto me through who God was and what He's done for me in Jesus. Man, I see this is a very difficult thing for people to understand. I spoke to a, to a friend of mine, Stephen Willifier, and um, uh, we spoke about righteousness. He says, Bert, you know, I, I don't know why people want to go off and into different funny doctrines if 99% of the church don't even understand righteousness by faith. Just preach that. That's what we need to do. I said to him, my brother, I agree with you 100%. 
the church don't even understand this scripture. This one. Then we want to get into other stuff and into funny doctrines about how to, how to manifest the life of God in us, how to do this, how to do that. Man, let's just first believe we are righteous without works and apply that to every area of life. When it comes to healing, when it comes to finances, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to building a church, that's it. He has imputed righteousness unto us without works. Now, righteousness uh, is seen by too many people as just um, uh, feeling holy a bit. That's not righteousness, man. That's just emotion of feeling holy a bit. Righteousness is being as right and as holy as what God is. Hallelujah. That's been imputed to me free from my works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man. Uh, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Comes this blessedness then to the circumcision or unto the uncircumcision. Also. For we say that faith, by faith, sorry, for we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So when we believe we have been made the very righteousness of God. Hallelujah. And then we've got, and then through that faith, that righteousness. Now listen to this. I, I want to read this. You, you must understand. It's Romans 1, 17, <clears throat> 16 and 17. Verse 16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You know, so many times we preach the gospel of Christians. That's wrong. That's the gospel of what Christians must do in order to get God to bless them. No, we're not preaching the gospel of Christians. We're preaching the gospel of Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. What He's done. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Now, that's one thing you must know. Forget, forget being saved without faith. Right. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, in this gospel about Christ, or Christ's gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed or manifested from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. Amen. Then it says verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, he says, listen, if you're not in the grace of God, and you're not in the, in the message of what Jesus has done for you freely, you, you will see all the time where God punishes, judgment, all of that. But when you are in the message of Christ's gospel, the gospel of Christ, the righteousness of God is manifested. That means it will be seen. It's not just hidden in God. It is seen in those that believe. It manifests. So that's why I can be healed. That's why I can be prosperous. That's why I will not worry or stress. Amen. You know what's so nice in this gospel crusade? And I'm just testifying about the righteousness of God. In this crusade, I could get Vessel to preach there. And I could get him pictures of what he's done on the website. Hallelujah. And of what everybody does will still be uploaded. Why? Because it's not me trying to build this ministry. They are just as righteous as what I am, as righteous as what God is. It's not about me doing something. It's about God and what God does for people. Hallelujah. I don't have to try and build myself up saying, look at the miracles God does through me. No, man. Let God do miracles through everybody and let everybody see that and that people can start to believe that they are also precious in the eyes of God that, God. that people can see God can use young and old people that's prayed, not prayed. If they just believe they are, they are made the righteousness of God. And it manifests. Amen. The righteousness of God. The right to heal sick people. Because you are a very, very, very good person. And the right for all blessings to come to God. Because He's a very, 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 very good God. Amen, is upon us. Given as a gift. The righteousness is by faith. And then, now listen, <clears throat> the righteousness is that goodness and that right to have. 
And justification is the manifestation of that righteousness. Okay? Now, don't think that you've been made righteous by faith and you are justified by your works. No, the Bible says we've been made righteous by faith and it says we've been justified by faith. So faith makes you righteous and faith in what Christ has done for you, faith in that God justifies the ungodly. It's what makes you righteous. Let me explain it. Read it again, Romans 4. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies, blesses, man, makes prosperous, justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. So you must believe that God can make an ungodly person blessed. Now an ungodly person isn't a giver, a holy lover, a, somebody that prays all the time. If you can believe that God can make that unholy person justify him, if you can believe that that faith is counted for righteousness. Hallelujah. That's the gospel of Jesus. Amen. Well, that's enough for one day. Bless God. I would like to pray for, and, and I felt I want to do this for friends of mine that is in, um, in Italy uh, and the son is in Canada and uh, they need to sell a house. And I want everybody on Web Church today <clears throat> and everybody in the studio to agree that that house will be sold and that there will come financial prosperity towards them on the basis of what Jesus has done for them. The Bible says if you need wisdom, pray of God that a braid is not. In other words, that doesn't look to the past or bring the past into remembrance in order to be blessed. And I thank God that He's going to give them wisdom and understanding to be prosperous and to be blessed in this situation. For we cannot see that people in, uh, that, that are in the message of grace go through these hard times. It's not needed. God makes a way where there seems to be no way. And I do believe that as we agree today, the Bible says where two or more agree, are in 100% agreement that because they are already righteous, they are good news believers, they are watching right now. Uh, um, <clears throat> they, they have been made righteous. And it is time for their justification. Hallelujah. Amen. So I want everybody to agree with them. They, they're really in my heart. I've prayed for them yesterday. And uh, or the day before yesterday, I've prayed for them a couple of times. I've prayed for them yesterday. And today, we are agreeing as a church, as a church family that love each other in the power of God. And we're going to see that touch in their lives. Amen. I just felt, especially, I know there are many people with needs, but I just wanted to lift her up and her son. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, I thank you that, uh, that you're a God that loves people. I thank you that you're a God that cares for people. I want to pray for Sherry and Lee right now. And I thank you, my God, that they are wonderful people made righteous by the blood of Jesus. And I thank you, my God, that they are people that are washed in your blood, clean, believing this message of grace. Therefore, we come with the authority of God and we speak over their situation. We say we break the power of this thing over their lives. That, that, that bondage of struggling financially has been broken in Jesus. And we say you've got no hold over them poverty for they've been made rich. And I want to repeat it. They've been made rich through Jesus. And thank you for your power that just flows through their situation. I remove this poverty, the struggling from them. And I say, you are made wealthy in Jesus. That house will sell, whatever other thing that they have, something miraculous is going to happen. I thank you for that, my God. It's going to go through. They're going to be blessed and get out of this situation. And then from there, I prophesy in the name of Jesus and say, it will never be like that ever in their lives again. <clears throat> in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Well, you can join us in Web Church if you like. Go, to, um, go on to Skype and you can just even, if you don't want to do the procedure that's written down there, you can just search for us. Search just, uh, just search for Web Church. 
and it will come and then ask us to put, put you on and we will put you on. Amen. Now, I hope there's not an overload today because we're still just running one uh, internet line, but I know very soon we're going to run another one. Oh yeah, and I want to say this. <clears throat> it seems to me as if we're going to have our web station sooner than what we think. We've, we've, um, we've, on, the, on the internet we've got a, a, a website where people, where you can start your own TV station, internet TV station, high quality, not a, a mediocre type of thing, of the best um, that you can, for free. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? Now, we will need some computers and stuff and staff that will work here to check all the content of uh, people that send in their messages because everything will be checked. It's going to be grace. It's not going to be somebody that preaches grace. It's going to be a, a, a people with a grace foundation and out of that they preach. Amen. Because you get a, a preachers that preach grace and then next time, next today, next week they preach sowing and reaping. Then you're not a grace preacher. You, then you are a preacher that has preached grace every now and then. But you're not a grace preacher preaching from the foundation of grace. And that's going to be a grace station. Hallelujah. Where you will never have to be ashamed to ask anybody to log in there. Because if they log in there, it doesn't matter when it is, they're going to find a message of grace that can bring an absolute change to their lives, encourage them and lift them up. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to go over to our song with, with which we're going to play out. And uh, just listen to this. May the grace of